Hello, Discovery Church, family and friends. Great to be with you tonight, this Wednesday, last Wednesday of May. Believe it or not, this coming Sunday is the last Sunday in May. And uh, June 1st will be here on Monday. Hard to believe, time flies. Uh, a couple of announcements for you uh, as we come to you from our home in Chesapeake, Virginia. Welcome to Cafe Worship, even though we're not in the cafe. Uh, the governor here in Virginia has allowed us uh, worship attendance of uh, a, a maximum of, well, that says a maximum of 50 people. Let me explain. Uh, we can have 50% of our occupancy, but we still have to practice the six-foot rule of separation, which in our largest facility gives us room for 50 people. And so that's why that says we have a max of 50 people. You see, there's no more invitations. Those of you who were invited uh, already to come to worship service, just come this coming Sunday. Don't wait for me to invite you. Don't wait for me to call, text, email. You're not going to hear from me. Just show up this coming Sunday because when you factor in all the people who are not ready or willing to come to church right now for a variety of reasons, and those, unfortunately, who have little ones that we can't accommodate right now and maintain the six-foot rule, uh, the number of people that we had this past Sunday was right on the money. So if you were here, uh, well, if you were at the church uh, the last two Sundays, just come again this Sunday, and I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, worship attendance, something new our governor has mandated takes effect this coming Friday. Masks are now required. There is an exception for those who will be speaking or leading the worship, but everyone else has to maintain wearing a mask at all times and maintaining the six-foot six rule. So uh, masks are required. If you would like to come to church this Sunday and you don't have a mask, let me know and or we'll have some available for you when you arrive and you'll be free to take one when you get there. Let me also share some offering information with you. This is nothing new, but in case we have some new folks tuning in, you may want to know this information. Here are the ways that you can give to the Lord, and it's important that you know you're giving to the Lord. You're not just giving to the church or an institution. You're not giving to any individual. You're giving to the Lord through Discovery Church, and you can mail checks. Our address is 4881. By the way, it's Discovery Church. 4881 Euclid Road, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23462. I'll give you a moment to jot that down in case you need to. Of course, you can always go back and watch this video later on if you're tuning in tonight via Facebook Live or if you happen to watch us on YouTube. Uh, but nonetheless, there's the address. You can also text give. And you can just take your little handy smartphone, uh, select or press open up your text giving app, and where you would normally type in someone's phone number or someone's name from your directory, you can just type in the numbers 73256. And down in the body where you would type any information or message to someone, you would just type in the word discovery. Remove the exclamation, excuse me, the uh, quotation marks. Don't include those. I just used the quotation marks to show you that's the word you enter. So type in Discovery, and then press send. It's important to press send. I can't tell you how many times I have tried to send a message to someone, and then hours later, I'm like, why hasn't this person responded? And I only to look at it and go, oh, well, dummy me, I forgot to press send. It does happen to the best of us, so don't forget to press send. When you press send, some options will come up, and just select those options. If you want to give to our general fund, just select tithes and offerings. There's, you can also select uh, fit and or fundraiser. And I understand that we're pretty close to meeting our fit goal for this quarter. So thank you all to all of you who are giving to that. And if you're wondering what fit is, it stands for faithfully investing together. It is uh, an emphasis to pay off the loan on our building sooner rather than later. We've got four years left on it, minus a month or two as we have collected extra funds. So thank you for contributing to that. So if you want to text to give, there's how you do that. If you want to uh, go to our website, uh, since you're tuning in through Facebook Live, you already have internet access. You probably have uh, been to our website, but if you haven't, just type in in your browser, www.discoverychurchvb.org, and then click on the Donate tab on the top right-hand side of the page. And select from the options. You have the same options there. And uh, 
that's how you can give online. Oh, I, I forgot this. You can also go to your bank or financial institution and you can set up monthly recurring giving. It's called an ACH draft, or at least that's what it used to be called back in the day. And you can set up recurring giving and your bank will just uh, draft from your account, whatever it is you set up and send it to our account. And it comes in month after month. Don't forget to record that in your check register uh, so you can make sure you keep your records accurate. But that's an easy way to give to the Lord through Discovery Church. And I know it's not as worshipful, but neither is text giving or online giving. But it is a way to be a faithful steward, a very good way to be a faithful steward, to have those already debited from your account without having to worry about missing. Well, so there's how you can give online and the ACH draft. You can also drop it by the church. You can come by Monday through Thursday between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., and someone will be there to receive your offering and put it in the safe and make sure it gets uh, counted at the next time we do our coloring. So you can do that. Just go to the church, and there's the address, 4881 Euclid Road. For those of you who are out of state, you may have a little difficulty with that. You can mail them in or, or give online. You can also uh, write a check or uh, cash or whatever, and we'll, we'll come pick it up from you. Someone will uh, be happy to come to your home or place of business, wherever it is that you are, and receive your offering. Prayer request. Same two from last week. Lucille Hamilton continued to recover from the fall that she had uh, two weeks ago tomorrow. But George Sadowski is back in the hospital. He's got congestive heart failure fluid on his lungs. So pray for him in a special way that he would be healed and pray for his family to have strength and comfort. And if you have other requests you would like for us to know about and pray for, feel free to give those to us through Facebook Live. You can do that now, provided you have approval and authorization from the person or persons that you are lifting up. And or you can text them to me, email them to me, call me, whatever it is, carry your pigeon. There are a variety of ways you can get them to me, and I'll make sure to share with the church that uh, you have a loved one or a situation that you would like for us to pray about. Speaking of prayer, why don't we start with prayer right now? Would you bow with me? Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you that we have a good, good Father in you, and that you love us with an everlasting love, and you have loved us even before the foundations of the world. We cannot fathom how good you really are but we thank you for being a loving heavenly father and we thank you for giving us this moment that we could come together albeit from our own homes and we could gather together virtually through facebook live and by the way facebook live administrators and mark zuckerberg thank you that you've given to us this platform and the privilege that we can use uh, the internet and a digital means to Keep our church together, so to speak. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless Facebook and the administrators therein and continue to use them and uh, provide, uh, use them in such a way that they can provide for us this uh, means that we can come together as Discovery Church, as a family, and as friends and worship you. Uh, even though we're apart, we can still worship together and be one in mind and body and soul and even in spirit. And thank you, God, for the privilege of lifting up Lucille and George. And in a special way, we want to lift up George to you right now. He's, he's had one problem after another, and uh, he needs your special healing touch upon him now. And so we, we pray, God, that you will bless him and heal him and be with Jamie as she uh, worries and is concerned for her father and uh, the rest of George's family as well. We want to lift them to you and pray for your peace and comfort to abide with them and give them strength and courage as uh, we lift them to you, both Lucille and George, asking you to bless and heal and protect and guide and deliver in such a way that you receive all the honor and the glory for it. And it's in Jesus' name that we do so. Amen. Old Church Choir is going to sing for you now. Uh, this is um, a song by Zach Williams. So this is a blessing. And spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my 
Don't let anything steal your joy. Let Jesus be the king of your heart. Nothing will steal your joy. Bible says it's good to give thanks to the Lord. Amen? He's about to say the same thing. The Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen? Clap along. I've come before you today.
All right, so we have a lot of things to be thankful for, amen? And tonight's question, is an internet-based internet Lord's Supper proper or even biblical? Great question. Uh, the reason why I chose tonight to answer this question is because a week from this Sunday is the first Sunday of the month. And historically, lots of churches, especially Baptist churches and Southern Baptist churches, observe the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of the month. Now, for the past couple of months, we've had a modified Lord's Supper. What I mean by modified is we've had only 10 people total in the church on the Sunday that we've observed the Lord's Supper. And so we've been able to have some small plates with a piece of bread and a small cup of grape juice in those cups, what we call the fruit of the vine, and each one has been able to come up and take that plate and go back to his or her seat individually and separately while maintaining the social distance requirements. Well, now that we have 50 people, 50 plus people in the church on Sunday morning, that doesn't seem to be feasible or practical to do it that way. And so now knowing this question has come up, uh, I don't know who submitted the question. Uh, I don't remember anyway. It's good to examine this question and give us some time to think about what we're going to do between now and the first Sunday of the month. We don't have to do it on the first Sunday of the month. And you know, for those of you who have uh, been with me while we've observed the Lord's Supper, you've heard me say on more than one occasion, I think we do it a little too often. There, and I know I'll get some backlash on that, but it's just my personal opinion. That we do it so often that it kind of loses its impact and its meaning and its reverence and its awe. And so let's take a fresh look at this tonight in light of the question that's asked, is an internet-based Lord's Supper proper or even biblical? Let me give you a short answer. Proper? Yes, it can be. Biblical? No, not in the context of Bible events. And what I mean by that is not in the context of when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and all the happenings and the goings on surrounding why and when he did it. That'll make more sense as we examine the question a little further. 
Short answer, proper, yes. Biblical, no. But, you know, this question is very similar to one we explored several weeks ago when someone asked the question about an online worship service. Is that biblical? Is it proper? Can you, can you do it with excellence? And so on and so forth. And, you know, the, the same answer came up then as it does now. And it has to do with, for us right now, you know, we have this COVID-19 pandemic that has really caused an uproar, well, and around the whole world, and particularly, you know, for us uh, right here in, in Virginia and the United States as a whole, it's caused many churches to um, get creative, you know, and how can we maintain all the things that we were once doing before this pandemic occurred? Some things we just can't, and or we, we can't do them the same ways. But this COVID-19, uh, and, and because of COVID-19, we have seen families and uh, communities come together as much as they can, but families in their homes have been attending church and uh, at least watching worship services and singing along and, and participating at home because that's all they can do legitimately to avoid the spread of this pandemic. Lots of churches, therefore, have had to get creative in order to continue doing what we were doing and... Well, I'll say continue what we've been doing as much as possible, including observing the Lord's Supper, while respecting the laws and the commands that have been imposed upon us. But some Christians find a measure of comfort in the fact that we can still participate in the Lord's Supper, virtually speaking, in our homes, but some, and I, I'm guessing this is kind of the, the impetus or the motivation behind the question, some question the validity of online worship services and the validity of online prayers and the validity of online uh, or digital giving and online Wednesday night worship services and certainly online or virtual Community services are, are they are they adequate? Are they valid? Are they biblical? You know, hence you know the question tonight. And again, it's a great question. And but I think the question comes from the standpoint of can you observe the Lord's Supper and still maintain the sanctity and reverence? that you would expect to have if we come together as a body of believers. I think that's probably the, the, the backstory behind the question. As we observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, can we maintain the sanctity, and hence the word you know, proper and, and biblical you know, reverence, can we maintain those in a virtual environment? Well... I guess we're going to have to see. I think we've been able to do it a couple of times, albeit for a small group of people in the church, and then however many people participated online. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you are watching at home, and you're not going to be with us the next time that we have the Lord's Supper, and I'll try to give you as much advance notice of when that's going to happen as possible, so you can get your own bread and you can get your own fruit of the vine, and have that in your home and be ready when we observe that, when we take of it. I don't know when that's going to be just yet, because we have a dynamic that we now have to figure out in the church with many more people, and. Just stay tuned for how and when we're going to observe that, and I will let you know uh, when you need to get your supplies. Well, here in Virginia, even though we've been allowed to have a 50% occupancy and maintain this six-foot rule, 
We also have the rule that we cannot pass anything from member to member. We can't pass offering plates. We can't pass pens. We can't pass uh, communion trays and cups and so on and so forth. We can't, we can't do that. It breaches the six-foot rule, number one. It also is a, an easy way to transfer or transmit germs and or the coronavirus from one person or one uh, item to another person. And so the way we have done it in the past obviously has to change, at least temporarily. And so again, we've got to work all that out. But having said all of that, let's look at two different aspects of the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and without further ado, here they are. The two different aspects of the Lord's Supper are corporate or congregational, a group setting, and then individual or personal. And I want to look at, if you will, we'll look at it with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 29. And we'll break those up into two different sections because we're first going to look at the corporate or congregational aspect of the Lord's Supper. And then we'll look at the personal or individual aspect of it out of the same chapter of 1 Corinthians uh, 11. And so here we are. Corporate Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 27 says this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meeting, should say meetings, do more harm than good. You can't proofread your own words. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Now, this is Apostle Paul writing to the people in the church of Corinth. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat or, and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. These verses that we just read outline our congregational responsibilities when it comes to observing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And I'm not trying to make more out of this than what it really should be. I'm trying to answer the question and maybe give a little more than just a yes, it's proper, and no, it's not biblical answer. So let's look at uh, what these congregational responsibilities are when we come together as a church body in a group and public fashion, not right now as we're separated uh, because of COVID-19. Here's what uh, four things I think are our congregational responsibilities. First and foremost, we focus on Jesus. Remember that it is the Lord's Supper. He instituted it on the Thursday before he was crucified on Friday, after Jesus and his disciples had celebrated the Passover meal. He took out a piece of hidden bread and he told them that it was his body that was given for them, broken for them. He gave his father thanks for it and he distributed it to his disciples. And he said, take this in remembrance of me. Now, the remembrance would come later on because he had not been crucified at that point, obviously. But he was telling them to remember him that this was his body. It represents his body. It's not his actual body. But first and foremost, we focus on Jesus. 
It's the Lord's Supper. We're focusing on the bread that represents Jesus' body. It's not anything else. Number two, we preserve order. And I don't simply mean the order of the bread and the juice and, the, you know, and getting those out of order. I've seen where those have been gotten out of order, and that's okay. What matters is that you, well, you take it in the right manner. <laughs> and I don't want to go too far because I don't want to get into the individual part too soon. But we preserve order. And what I mean by order is orderliness. We take it in a, in a manner that um, is respectful. And again, keeps the focus on Jesus. And what I mean by order is not chaos, not disrespectful. Uh, elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we find that God is not a God of chaos. And in the context of speaking in tongues, he says, Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order. And that doesn't mean necessarily 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. In that context of speaking in tongues, it has a little more emphasis there. One speak, one interpret, one speak, one interpret. That order. But we preserve order. We, do, we preserve an orderly fashion of doing it. Uh, a respectful and respectable manner. We also practice unity. In the previous verses, we read that right here... I'm, I'm searching for it. Right there. Verse 19. No doubt there have to be differences among you. But look at verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. The body of Christ cannot be divided. We have to be a unified body. I think it's John chapter 14 or 17. I'm just off the top, off top of my head. It might be 17. When Jesus prayed... Uh, anyway, one of the two, Jesus prayed for the unity of the disciples. That just as unity exists between Jesus as the Son and God as the Father, that he wanted that same unity to be an identifying characteristic of his body, the church. And so Paul is saying, hey, I hear that there are divisions among you. When you practice the Lord's Supper, well, there should be no divisions among us. We should be a united body. And so we... When we come together, our congregational responsibilities include practicing unity. More about that in just a moment. And we avoid overeating. Now, some of you are probably laughing if you haven't already about that one. Uh, in, in What is typical in the Baptist church is you get a very small piece of bread and a very tiny cup of the fruit of the vine. Hardly anything that you could overeat on. But in fairness to the context of what was happening in the church at Corinth, uh, it starts out by saying that, first of all, hey, people aren't waiting for everyone to get there. They're being rude, and they're forcing their way, and they're going ahead and they're eating as much as they want of the meal that is prepared. Not just the Lord's Supper, a fellowship meal. Some might call it a love feast, whatever. And some people were just eating and eating and eating and eating. And Paul was condemning that. He said, you shouldn't do that. First of all, wait for everyone to get there. Practice or preserve order. That's another way to preserve order. Practice unity. And don't eat more than your share. Again, we have a small piece of bread. We have a tiny cup of the fruit of the vine. And we make sure that everyone has an opportunity to receive those. Now, at Discovery Church, we practice what is called open communion. And that simply means that it doesn't matter if you happen to be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Catholic, whatever denomination you're from, as long as Jesus is your Savior and Lord, you are free to take, open to take. It is for everyone and anyone who knows Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, well, first of all, the, the elements of the Lord's Supper really don't have any meaning to you. They represent his body and his blood. If you don't recognize him as Savior and Lord, it's meaningless. But if you're taking it 
and you don't know Jesus, mm, that's not good because of these things. The individual Lord's Supper and the individual aspect of the Lord's Supper. Picking up with verse 28, 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. That's an important word. Before. Not during, not after. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, since we call, since we practice what is called open communion, we do not withhold the elements of the Lord's Supper from anyone. It should be left to the individual who examines himself or herself that if you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, you don't acknowledge him, you don't recognize him, then you're bringing judgment on yourself. Not from me or from other people, but you stand judged by the word of God and by the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And so uh, these two verses outline our individual or personal responsibilities as church members and as Christians, first and foremost as Christians, not just church members. And so three things here. It looks like there's four because of this four carryover from the previous line, but it's actually just three. Number one, examine yourself. And what are you examining yourself for? You're examining yourself to make sure that you're in the right place with the Lord and with other people. It's very difficult to take of the Lord's Supper in the proper manner and in a biblical manner if you are out of fellowship with the Lord, if you don't know the Lord to begin with, or if you're out of fellowship with him, there's something in between you and him, some sin that is unrepented, unconfessed, and so on and so forth. And be reminded what uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that brings us back to a right relationship with him. But if you're at odds with someone else, another human being, a brother or sister in Christ, somebody in the church, a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor, whatever, if you're out of sorts with someone, you probably should not take at the Lord's Supper because you're not in the right frame of mind. You're certainly not in the right spiritual condition to receive the elements of the Lord's Supper in the right way. Certainly not in a reverent way. So examine yourself for being in the right position, in the right place, in the right relationship with God and with other people. And also look for evidence of pride. You know, the proverb says, pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Pride's a terrible thing. Terrible, terrible thing. That self-centered, egocentric mind that is part and parcel of our world and our humanness. It, it takes some self-examination and even, even some self-determination to keep that pride at bay. Second thing is recognize the body of Christ. Similarly to number one in the the previous our congregational responsibilities is you know focus on Jesus it's all about him recognize the body of Christ recognize that the bread represents Jesus's body keyword represents it is not his physical body it represents his physical body and the fruit of the vine is not his actual blood the fruit of the vine it could have been there was probably wine then, whether it was fermented or unfermented. That's a battle for another day, question for another time, one I'm not eager to get into for a variety of reasons. But recognize the body of Christ. Recognize that the elements that you're taking in observation and observance of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper are, in fact, representative of the Lord's 
body, and blood. It's important to make that significant recognition. Jesus died physically. His body was lifeless. He experienced an enormous amount of pain and agony and suffering in his body as well as to his mind and his heart relationally, especially. It's important to recognize that the bread represents the body of the one Savior of the world who was willing to take the sin of the world upon him, himself, upon his own flesh. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, the Bible says. It's important to recognize the bread represents Jesus' body, the Savior of the world, who gave himself and gave himself up for, physically, put himself in our place, physically, on the cross. It's also important to recognize that the fruit of the vine represents Jesus' blood, the precious, spotless Lamb of God, whose priceless blood paid the price for all sin, for all humanity, once and for all, those who have ever lived in eternity past, those who will ever live in eternity future, and those of us who are alive right now in the present, the blood of Jesus paid the price for our sin once and for all. It's an incredible thing to try to grasp intellectually, but also emotionally and personally, that the blood of Jesus paid the price for your sin and mine 2,000 years before we were ever born. 2,000 years before we were ever born, before we ever came into this world. He paid in advance of our sin. It's important, important to recognize that the fruit of the vine, and think about it for just a moment, both bread and wine, juice, he made them. But he said they represent his body and blood. The Lord who created all things tells us to recognize these elements of bread and water, if you will, his living word, his living water, recognize that they were given for us for no reason. They weren't given for us for no reason, but for an incredible reason, to pay the price for our sin. Jesus physically went to the cross in our place, and his blood paid the price for our sin. You know, the Bible says that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus shed his blood on the cruel, rugged cross of Calvary for your sins and mine. And number three, uh, an individual and personal responsibility of ours as we observe the Lord's Supper is that we have a lowliness of mind and a lowliness of heart, and that means humility. Notice pride is up here. Examine yourself for pride and pridefulness and root that out. And take instead the mantle of humility found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let me share that with you real quick. The Apostle Paul was writing to his, what I think was his favorite church, the church at Philippi. Some people call, call it Philippi. It's probably Philippi, but anyway... This onion skin paper, I'm skipping right over it, not on purpose. So hang on, I'm just going to use my thumb pad and get right to it. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 say this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, which is pride, or vain conceit. We talked about that in weeks past. But in humility, 
consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So we should examine ourselves. We should recognize the body and blood, or the bread and the juice, as the body of Christ. And we should have a lowliness of mind, have a humility, have humility about us. That doesn't mean that we're being humiliated, but have a humble spirit about us as we observe the Lord's Supper. Now, whether it's here, there, or anywhere else, that really doesn't make any difference. But earlier I mentioned that this question is very much one like, is very much like the one asked several weeks ago concerning online worship services and the validity of those services. And we concluded then that the Internet was not discovered at the time of the events of the Bible or when the events of the Bible were unfolding. And, and that, it, it, that does not invalidate the purpose and meaning of the church gathering together, even digitally, virtually, uh, in online form, whatever, for a temporary span of time. I mean, this, is, this, is not a, this is not a replacement for the church. And it's not a replacement for the observation of or the observance of the Lord's Supper. This is a temporary thing. Please be reminded that this is a temporary situation and a temporary um, uh, creative way of doing church, if you will. And so, uh, well, you might remember that at that time I spoke about Bedside Baptist Church. I remember I had the Freudian slip of saying Bayside Baptist Church, giving them a shameless plug. But anyway, Bedside Baptist Church, a running joke about people that stay home on Sundays instead of going to church. Well, anyway, when these verses about the Lord's Supper were written in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, well, same thing. The technology for virtual communion wasn't even possible. There was no internet. There, was, there, were no, there weren't televisions and uh, computers and tablets and cell phones. And none of those things existed. We didn't have the technology for it, so it, it wasn't possible. But early Christians did meet in homes. Not because there was a pandemic, of course, but they did meet in homes. Most churches at the time of the New Testament were house churches, home churches, uh, just a small group of people gathering together in someone's house. Today, churches that opt for or decide to have an online presence and uh, use a, a forum like Facebook Live or Zoom or uh, maybe they use a YouTube channel or something of that nature, you know, we're, we're doing this because we have to, but also because we're concerned about the spread of this virus. Now, I've, I've shared with you before, I'm not personally all that worried about it, but I know that there are others who are. And so, um, understanding that, accommodating that, grasping that, but also keeping the church together and going and moving and, and staying connected, albeit digitally or virtually, well, it's the best that we can do for now, right now, uh, so holding a virtual Lord's Supper, uh, you know, again, we've, we've had to do it a couple of times in creative, in a small, creatively in a, in a small group, a small environment, and we'll see what we come up with between now and the next time we do it. But holding a virtual Lord's Supper, um, you know, the, the individual aspects of the Lord's Supper can still be met. You can still examine yourself before taking. You can still recognize the body of Christ, and you can still have a lowliness of mind and heart as you take of the Lord's Supper. Whether you're at home or whether you're in church, those things still stand. They're still viable, they're still valuable, and they can still be maintained. It's the corporate aspect of the Lord's Supper that is, may I use the word virtually? Virtually impossible if not impossible.
But even in an online communion service or Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, uh, Eucharist, Holy Communion, wh whatever word or term or phrase you want to put there, even if it is led online, held online, uh, and you practice at your own home or observe at your own home, there is still a certain amount of connectedness with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I can remember several years ago on Sunday morning in the worship service, we're, we're praying. And at that time, most every church met at 11 o'clock in the morning. Isn't it interesting to know that at the time that we were praying at 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever time during that worship service, there were thousands and thousands of other churches praying simultaneously. And even churches that weren't meeting at 11 o'clock, but they might have been meeting around the world, some in underground churches, some in completely different time zones and completely different countries. They're praying, and, and that is an aspect of being part of the universal body of Christ, the church as a whole. It's still a point of connectedness. And I can remember someone saying, isn't it neat to know that right now other churches, other people in other churches all around the world are praying just like we are. They're praying to the same God for his will to be done and for his, his uh, son to be magnified and glorified and for the spirit to move and for us to, to worship and experience him Today. Isn't it neat to know that at the same time, all around the world, people are praying right now? It's just as true in observing the Lord's Supper. All around the world. And even in your home. We may not be able to see each other but we're still participating in the Lord's Supper at the same time. Just like we're participating in worship services at the same time. Some of you are staying home, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You're watching on Facebook, and uh, you're still staying connected to the church that way. And it's important to do so. When this pandemic is over and all the restrictions are lifted, I look forward to seeing everybody back at church again. And a whole lot more people, too. But everyone can be participating at the same time. And everyone's focus can still be on Jesus. And that's one aspect of the, the congregational responsibility that can still be maintained even though we're apart from each other. You can still keep your focus of the Lord's Supper on the Lord. Amen? You can still keep your focus on the Lord. So again, we may not be able to see each other, but we're, we're all in everyone's hearts and in everyone's minds, and we're still connected by the Holy Spirit, and we're still of one blood, according to Acts. We're still of one blood. So this means that there is still a common fellowship through a virtual observance of the Lord's Supper. Now, obviously, it's not the ideal situation, but it is what it is. And remember, it's only temporary. It's not the ideal situation, but it is you know, the, the best that can be done right now. You know, I have, have a group of people together who observe the Lord's Supper, and it's recorded, or it's on Facebook Live, it's broadcast, and you're invited to participate wherever you are, in your home, or um, I, I hope you're still staying home and, and quarantining. I know some people are throwing caution to the wind, and they're just going crazy, but you can still participate, and it's the best we can do for right now. But if self-examination and reverence for the Lord are still practiced individually and personally, then a virtual communion or a virtual Lord's Supper can be and is a viable method for maintaining church unity. That's another aspect of the corporate responsibility. We can still maintain those, albeit it's just different from what is what we are used to and, and, and what is the norm, and certainly not necessarily what we would all like, but it can still be done. 
Well, so conclusion for you. Worshiping God through the observance of the Lord's Supper is not about being in a particular building. We often make the mistake of thinking that the church is the building. The church is not the building. The church is the people and the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you meet in a building or outside in a field somewhere, under a tree, in a park, where you're still the church. You're still the church if you're at home. Granted, once the restrictions are lifted and this pandemic is behind us, I look forward to seeing everybody back at church, just like we did before. There might be some changes as a result of the pandemic, particularly with regard to sanitation and cleanliness and, and some behavioral practices, but we still can come together. And even now, temporarily, we can still come together, even though we're apart. Let me finish reading here. Worshiping God through the observance of the Lord's Supper is not about being in a particular building or even the exactness of the elements used. You may remember before when I uh, shared with you that, hey, we're going to practice the Lord's Supper this coming Sunday. Make sure you get your bread and your juice, whatever it is. If you, don't, if you can't find grape juice, orange juice, or apple juice, or water, whatever it is that you choose to use, the exactness of the, of the elements is not really the point. It's about remembering what Jesus did for us when his body was broken and his blood was shed for our sins. I know it's hard to see that word, but it's sins, S-I-N-S. The Lord's Supper is all about Jesus. Remember, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, him. It's not about us. It's all about him. It's the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper is all about Jesus, and we should keep it that way no matter where we are. Whether we are together in one building or whether we are apart in a lot of separate buildings, our homes, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we have an individual and personal responsibility to keep our pride out of the way, examine ourselves, recognize that the bread and the juice represent Jesus' body and blood. And make sure, make sure that our focus is always on him. It is about him. We don't want to be judged or misjudged because we made it about us rather than him. Well, anyway, let's pray together, and then we'll have one song to close us out. You may or may not uh, know this next song, and if you want to stick around and, and learn it a little bit, then that would be great, and you'll have a little more awareness and familiarity, familiarity with it the next time. But uh, let's pray for now, and uh, we'll close our time together. Lord, we thank you, and we give you praise that in your infinite wisdom, you instituted uh, an incredible observance called the Lord's ordinance, called the Lord's Supper. Your Supper, it's all about you. The elements represent your body and your blood. And God, we can't thank you enough for the sacrifice that you made in giving up your only begotten Son and putting him on the cross in our place, where it is that we all rightfully deserved to be. Because of our sin, which separates us from you. And your word says our sin causes you to not listen to us or hear our prayers. God, we can't thank you enough for Jesus. And we can't thank Jesus enough for his willingness to give of himself. And we can't thank your Holy Spirit enough for bonding us together and preserving us and keeping us together in a holy unity that is the body of your son Jesus. Lord, again, we thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's, uh, we're going to go out with a song by Sanctus Real. It's called Confidence. Mm -hmm.